I'll give you a uh, short introduction to artificial intelligence with neural networks uh, so that even if you don't know anything about this when showing up, you can still uh, know a little bit about how these things we're talking about are working. And I'm making three promises, no math, no programming, and you'll still get to know some relevant questions to ask about artificial intelligence or AI systems or whatever. So quick overview, uh, the presentation is also on uh, the homepage under this some pointers thing. Um, but first of all, what is a neural network? How do we train and program, program them? What do they need to work? And what questions are the relevant questions to ask? And uh, the systems we'll be uh, working with today and the systems I'll be talking about is a specific kind of systems based on artificial neural networks. And they are learning from examples, what in the business is called supervised learning. And um, that covers a lot of ground. So uh, that should be relevant to know about. So neural networks, we have in our heads and animals have them, plants I don't think so much. And uh, natural neural networks can be described with some concepts. They have some neurons. I think these are the ones that I kind of colored some brightish color here. Uh, these neurons have an activation, which means they can send our little electrochemical blips, little signals. And some of them are very active. Some of the time they're very active. They can send out a lot of blips. And sometimes they're more quiet. That uh, depends on the neuron and the time and what people are thinking about and whatever. Then we have connections, which in natural networks are called synapses. You can see all these uh, wires, all spaghetti around. And these connections have weights, and uh, which means that some of them are very strongly connected. Some of them are just weakly connected. And also the weights can be positive or negative. There can be uh, connections so that one neuron, when being active, makes another neuron more active. Or they can be negative, so one specific neuron being active can tend to make the neuron at the other end calmer. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, yeah, there are lots more to know about this. I'm not a neuroscientist. Ask somebody who is. But just a couple of weeks ago, the complete uh, map of the brain of the fruit fly larva was published. And a little larva like this has around 3,000 neurons and about 500,000 connections between the neurons. So that perhaps gives a sense of scale. The concept can be transferred to artificial neural networks. Or when I say neural red networks, the rest of the presentation is just an artificial neural network. We still have neurons. They're represented here with these little boxes. They still have activation. That's not about sending out signal. That's just a number that's somewhere in the computer memory. Each of these has a number which can be higher or lower, more or less active. There's connections, as you can see, between them. And these connections have weights. On this picture, the blue weights are positive. So when this neuron is active, for instance, this neuron will tend to also be activated. Some of them are negative. When this neuron is active, it will tend to make this neuron less active. And that's not happening in some kind of spaghetti soup. It's happening on computer chips. And um, that's about it. And I'll try and explain about these neural networks with a simple example. That's kind of a uh, beginner's example in machine learning the Titanic passenger list. And what happens is we'll get a part of the passenger list. And uh, in this case, we'll look, narrow it down to age, ticket price, and gender of the people on the passenger list. And then we'll also get to know, are these people dead or alive at the end of the movie? And um, we'll use this to train our neural network. And uh, there's about 900 people on that list. Afterwards, there will be uh, another list with uh, 500 people where 
as part of an exercise, we know who lived and died on the Titanic more or less, but as part of the exercise, we'll get only this data and then the neural network will have to predict whether they lived or died. And then we can test, did our neural network actually work well to predict? And uh, how do we train a neural network like this? Well, it's pretty much like uh, training for anything really. If we want to play tennis, we start training our tennis serve. And what we do is we try to serve. <coughs> then we compare where did the ball, the ball go compared to where we want it. And then we adjust and we try again. Repeat, 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 practice makes perfect. When we do this with a neural network, it looks a bit different. First, we have to decide on a neural network shape and properties. And the shape on the left here will have three input neurons for each of our three data points. And um, so the activation of these neurons will be, um, depends on the age and the ticket price and the gender of the person we're looking at. Then over here, we need to have one output neuron because there is one single number that comes out is, did this person survive or not? And in between, we put some neural network, selecting how big that should be and some other mathematical details. That's a matter of uh, skill, experience, a lot of experimenting. That's a human skill. So I chose two by four neurons for this. The next thing we do is we randomize the weights. All these weights here, totally random. So of course, it'll just give random results at the beginning. We start setting, say we have a woman here, age 62, who paid $55 for her ticket. And uh, we put that into the activ activations here, the activations and these weights, which are so far just random, they'll decide the activation of these neurons. These activations and these weights, which are also random, will decide the activations of these neurons. And so more random weights combined with, in, combined with these neurons will decide what is the activation of the output neuron. And let's say in this case we get 0 0.22. So far so good. Next step, we compare to what we want, our target, which is a one because in the passenger list this woman is registered as survived. So we're not very good. If we had gotten 0 0.98 or something, that would have been good. This is not so good. So that brings us to the adjustment step. We do the calculations sort of backwards and say, which of these weights were pulling the answer in the right direction? Which of these weights were pulling the answer in the wrong direction? So we adjust the connection and perhaps also the sign of all these connections. And um, that's it. We've done it for one passenger. Then we do it again for the next passenger and the next passenger and the next passenger, all through the 900 passengers on our list. <coughs> when we're through with the 900 passengers on our list, uh, probably the network has gotten a little bit better, but not good enough. We go through the entire list 100 times. And that takes, on the computer, I did it on a pretty normal computer, about five seconds. Uh, this is a pretty small neural network. But uh, at the end, it's ready for use. And now actually using it is much cheaper than training. That's again like tennis. Um, it's not so hard for a tennis player to uh, play a tournament game. It's uh, all these many, many, and many hours of training before you get to the Wimbledon that actually count. And it's the same thing here. Training the networks will take a long time. Actually using them is faster because we only go through each passenger once. And um, we don't have to do these backwards calculations to adjust the network either. And uh, in this example, I tried actually doing this. And um, of course, if you just flip a coin randomly, live or die, you'll get a 50% get a uh, success rate in guessing. 
you can uh, be uh, very quick and a bit pessimistic and just guess that everybody dies. In that case, you get a percent, uh, success rate of about 60% because the majority actually died. Uh, with a simple neural network like this and just this input, um, it got to around 75% success rate. So uh, the network will have gained some kind of knowledge and um, you can take all these numbers which represent the shape of the network and uh, the connections and you can send them to another computer and other computers can just learn from the original example, so to speak. Now, we get to the requirements. What do we need to do this? Which also gets us pretty close to what are the questions we can intelligently ask about AI systems. First thing is, we need data. We need lots of data. We need data both over here on the input side, but we also need data over here on the output side. In this case, it was the survival of these people on the list. Lots of data that we can go through and train on. We uh, also need an objective. In this case, the thing we measured the neural network by, the thing that it was trained for, optimized for, was predicting people, predicting, the, predicting their survival. And um, that's number two. Number three is we need some engineering skill for this. This was uh, pretty much a toy problem, but uh, the bigger these things get, uh, the more things there'll be uh, to uh, worry about. And uh, there's a bit of engineering skill, skill involved in this. And also we need lots of specialized computing power. Not for the Titanic, but uh, if you uh, look at people training chat GPT, for instance, or some of these image generation algorithms we'll look at, then uh, that's definitely uh, up in the multi-million dollar category. Um, so uh, depending on what you want to do, but if you want to do these really big, interesting, crazy systems, then it's expensive. So. The questions we can ask is, first about the data. The AI will look for pattern, it will look for patterns in the data. And um, you need to have the right data and enough data for the pattern you want to look for to be there, otherwise you're not going to see it. That's of course one thing. But also, if there is a pattern in the data, and then it's, quite likely that your AI will actually find it. But there's a big question, which is, is the pattern something that reflects reality or does it just reflect the data? Because data does not always really reflect reality. Actually, I would say data never completely re reflects reality. There is always some bit of selection or collection involved that means that you're not quite looking at what you might think can uh, think about crime. Maybe we make an artificial intelligence to look at crime. It will not see crimes that are happening. It will see crimes that are reported that get into your database. Does the data match uh, the outcome you are actually interested in? If there is some kind of discrimination reflected in the data that your AI is trained on, the AI is going to find it and uh, it's going to replicate it. That may be what you want, it may not be. Um, just saw one example recently uh, about an AI system here in Denmark. Some years ago, uh, Gladsaxe Kommune were looking for um, a way to uh, find bad parents using AI. And so bad parents are, for instance, people who have to take their kids to the dentist or the doctor and then they don't show up. Apparently they don't care enough about their kids' health to show up. That's a big red flag, of course. And uh, that was true for some part of the data. But also for some part of the data, this thing actually reflected that they had changed the time. They had called in and said, oh, I want another appointment. Can we actually make it today? Because 
my kid is really bad or something. So the time was changed. And in some of these systems, the original appointment was not listed as canceled or something. It was listed as parent didn't show up. And um, then people got a black mark against them. We've got to be careful about where do the data come, where does the data come from. So next question that's over on this end. What are we training for? And yeah, say self-driving cars. When we get into a car, we uh, have to decide do we want to get there quickly or do we want to get there safely? We kind of balance things depending on how busy we are and whatever. But who decides for a self-driving car? Then, of course, we have the question, how well does the system actually perform for what it's being used for? We can have false positives. We can have parents who get notified being bad parents when they aren't. We can have false negatives, parents who are not spotted as being bad parents when in fact they are. Um, I presume Professor Christiansen's group working on diagnosis from medical images, they are thinking a lot about what can happen with false positives and negatives? In what kind of a context can you actually use this? And also, the last point, political and technical problems are entangled in practice. Uh, so I call this the engineering part. We can't just give the engineers a specification and say, go and do this, and they'll come back, and they will have some kind of completely objective way to do that. Even in this simple example with the Titanic, I have to deal with the age data missing from some people. Also, when uh, looking at the ticket price, I did not put the ticket price directly. I put in the logarithm. Oops, there was some math. Um, and I used the logarithm of uh, the ticket price for various reasons, which sound reasonable enough. But if you use those same reasons for discussing our tax system, they are suddenly quite controversial. So I was kind of making political choices. And uh, we can't completely separate the polit politics and the technology. So uh, there will be a uh, need for people who are good upstanding citizens and also know a lot of weird details about neural networks. Then let's talk about power and money. That's always relevant. First of all, all the data, who can collect it? Where does it come from? Who has the power to collect it? Uh, what about copyright? What about privacy, that kind of stuff? Who has the many million dollars it takes to trade these big AI systems? And um, under what license terms will these systems be available? That varies a bit. If you look at ChatGPT, we have zero access to it. It's something running on somebody else's computer. And uh, we can get to their website and ask them, please, can I use ChatGPT today? And they decide. Other systems are able to be downloaded for use with some kind of license, maybe a license that does not allow commercial use. Then you'll have to talk to the people who build it. Other kinds of licenses, that's very relevant. And also, will this condense to the usual few semi-monopolies and what can we do to stop it? That's the last question is here where you kind of feel I maybe have a program. And um, it might, it might not. I don't know. I just say that at least there is slightly less tendency to monopolies maybe than when it comes to, uh, say, social networks. I pretty much need to use the same social network as my friends. I do not necessarily need to use the same AI system as my friends. But there are still a lot of forces that will tend to attract more users, more data, more money to the systems that are big and powerful already and make them even more big and powerful. And uh, it can end up um, interesting. That's the end. Thank you for your time. Um, we don't have much time for questions or anything, but if somebody's burning with a comment or two, maybe uh, you can just say it and we'll all listen. <laughs>